<laughs> All right, so here we are. This is talk two of day 75 or whatever well, we yeah. are on. This is Jennifer Shea. She's going to talk about collaborative participant. No, no community. Based. Based. Participatory research. Participatory research. Sorry, I got that mixed up with, with my participatory action research. It's Very the same, simple, it's same, same stuff. thing. You probably will ask some questions. First time teaching outside, but it's my first time teaching when it's snowing. <laughs> and with all this horns behind me. Um, does anybody know what community based participatory research is? <laughs> <Darryl knows. laughs> um, so, when we think about putting together a research project, what is the first thing that we do? I love that answer because I made a yeah. So community-based participatory research is totally different. I had to make a visual aid. <laughs> so the, I know. So the first thing we do is build partnerships. So that takes a bit of time. Um, you could be building your partnerships for a number of years, and the research idea itself comes from the community that you're working with. And the whole purpose of that is because they are the experts of their own reality. Um, so in looking at health, if there's a health concern, they know what the health concern is and what they want to study. And because I do a lot of work with indigenous communities, um, these are communities that have been researched quite an off, like quite a lot over the years and often at times to their benefit. Um, so community-based participatory research is to really give voice to individuals who are marginalized um, and it's an empowering research philosophy. So when you partner with community, you are partners and do everything together right from the start right to the end. So the design of the research, the question, the planning, the analysis, um, the reporting, all of that is done in a circle as partners. I need to look at my thing. So <laughs> over, you know, when we think about colonization and we think about oppression and marginalization, research has been used as a tool um, to further oppress individuals. So I'm also going to tie in some examples from the strike as well um, as we're going through, talking this through. Um, but when we think about um, how can we, what are some ways data could be used to uh, perpetuate a narrative? So for example, um, when we were getting ready to go on strike, uh, the university put out false information about our salaries as faculty members, and that was data manipulation. And the reason they did that was to turn the public against us and to make us look like we're overpaid, greedy snobs, <laughs> basically. Also, when we look at the data that came out of the Faculty of Science, um, 6,000 students supposedly it had contacted Dean's office upset but really it was one. So the data was portrayed in a way that helps that case, but not that, you know, the individual. So when we think about how it's been used as a tool of oppression in research, it could, it's used to paint a false narrative um, and to perpetuate, um, you know, mis misconceptions that you may have about individuals, um, racism at times as well. It's utilized for that purposes. So it's really important to move away from that old structure and work with community, especially if it's things that directly impact them. Um, so we talked about data, so that was a big thing, um, you know, making sure the communities you work with have to have a really big piece and interact and be leaders in how the data is analyzed and um, shared with based work and it also ties to action research as well. Usually when you're doing this type of work, you're trying to change, make a change, a structural change. So there's an action component that goes along with it. Um, so with that, it's really important that the community guides what is done with the data and how it's shared with the public and their communities first and foremost and utilized to create change. So for example, if it was looking at, you know, you needed needs to go 
to. And so academic publications are not the first priority in community-based participatory research. The first person, the first people that need to get the results are the community and those members who the data is about. And because it's community-based research, they also are the ones who control that data. just that you know academic is not the expert um, everybody brings something to the table and everybody comes together in a collective um, to talk about that. So when we think about you know oftentimes traditional knowledge and knowledge of communities are downplayed as important um, one example we can think about within our province is the Cobb moratorium so I was a child of the moratorium <laughs> growing up and before the moratorium happened the Fisher people were all saying that back, we need to not fish, we're overfishing, we're ruining the ocean, and they were ignored. And now we know what happened, um, because the people who are living that life and know those waters or know that community know better than anybody else. Um, and oftentimes, greed and corporate drive is what, you know, doesn't actually make sure we're doing the right thing. Um, so that's another really important piece too. So making sure that the message and how you are portraying information is done so in a respectful way. And I think that is all. I was going to do a really short talk and I think I did that. And sorry, I'm like, I'm freezing right now. <laughs> sorry, thank you. So, uh, oh, wait there, now, one more thing. Any oh, sorry, one, one more, more thing. One more thing. Fear deal. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sure. Ah, that's funny. All right, any questions from the audience? Oh my God, my hands are freezing. Can you provide a specific example without getting too specific on how community-based partnership research has gone terribly bad? From my experience? Or in general? I think that Okay, so an example of how it went bad is someone saying they're doing community-based participatory research, but they're not actually doing participatory research. And they may be entering into the relationship um, with not, you know, true intentions. Um, and it may be to further their career, um, especially if there's like an area that's like a hot research area. People may want to do that, but they may not actually have the, you know, the commitment and the drive and the longevity to keep those relationships up and be com committed to it. Because it's, it's also not easy work either. Um, and, it, you know, things take longer, but it's, it's important. I don't know if that's helpful. Yeah. Like, these are things that have lost money in the current situation. Like, these are things that have lost money in the current situation. Like, I'm the last person who would be inclined to do things. People like yourself, people are great. Yeah. 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 All right. Oh, another question. Oh, another question. Great, thank you. Yeah, and a quick question is, uh, what uh, do you think of the generalizability of the results from one specific community to other communities? trying to create change for that specific community or group, but at the same time, um, the process and the creation of whatever you, the outputs are, or, you know, those are transferable in terms of sharing that knowledge with other communities and other individuals that are working in that area. 